Welcome back, Darts Aloud listeners, to episode now 57. And um, we're talking all about God's intervention um, in life and in its realm, God's intervention in science. We're looking at a topic that's titled The Scientific Status of Design Inferences. And if that hasn't lost you already, just hold on because Ed will try and pull you back in. Okay, I'll do my best. So what's going on here is our um, 50 Arguments for God book. And um, the randomizer has uh, coughed up chapter 25. And the title of the chapter is The Scientific Status of Design Inferences. So here we are in um, ID, which is um, intelligent design, which is basically a scientific wrapper over the idea of God as a creator that, uh, or as a designer, an architect. Um, of of the world and particularly biology um now the the book itself actually is edited all these 50 chapters and 50 arguments is edited by two people one of which is william dembski which might be a familiar name for many um a leading figure in the intelligent design um community i should say uh and 19 of the 50 chapters in the book are on um science and of those 17 are on biology evolution uh creation well intelligent design those topics so that's a third of the book so it's not surprising that sooner or later it's going to start hitting us with the randomizer and it has actually come up again i think eugenics was probably under this thing because of that's where they were starting from it as being darwin's fault um, but we did a eugenics a while ago, and I'm sure it's sooner or later it'll be coming up again from our randomizer. Um, but um, here we have a very narrow question, uh, and that is can design be a scientific, an area of scientific study when we look at biology? And I guess. Um, a key issue, a key concept is methodological naturalism. I'm sure it's a, a phrase we've used before, but Francis, it might be quite good for you to give us a quick um, overview. Um, well, methodological naturalism, as opposed to, um, I've forgotten the other type of naturalism. But methodological, that's right, philosophical naturalism. Wasn't that difficult, wasn't it? Well, I don't know why I forgot <laughs> that. Um, is the approach that scientists use, which is that uh, they're, in their methodology, they will only consider that um, uh, there is a naturalistic world and they don't infer the existence of spirits or things outside the, the natural world that we can see and study. Uh, philosophical naturalism would be wider ranging and would say, well, there is nothing outside that world. Uh, that's actually a philosophical position, whereas methodological naturalism doesn't necessarily deny the possibility of God or spirits or things outside the natural world. It just says they can't form part of our science. Um, science just has to look at what's within the world and what we can see and what we can measure and we can't start making assumptions or basing our theories on these um, uh, external beings who are not part of the natural world is that a good enough outline do you yeah. think yeah yeah so you can see there's a clash immediately between an assumption of methodological naturalism or, or, or using that method to do science and the idea that science can include study of design and um, therefore the idea of an external supernatural agent. Mm. I guess there is a sort of, it's not covered in the chapter and I, I just sort of mention it to dismiss it, but there's, I can think of two ways where you might try and marry the two. Um, one would be this idea that uh, aliens um, are responsible for biology, that, that uh, somehow some alien race has sort of designed life on earth which seems ridiculous uh, and then um another one would be this discussion of simulation mm. the, the whole of the universe is somehow a, su a super simulation mm. um 
but uh, let's please let's not go. <laughs> go <there too> <laughs> yeah. Much. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> no, probably worth know... doing on its own, but not not. Yes. As, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, we 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 note those uh, possibilities and we move on. <laughs> Good, <laughs> quick, walk away quietly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to see here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, OK, the the chapter we're talking about in this book, um, and of course, all the um, show notes have the links to the book. Um, he is a philosopher and a physic, uh, and a, I think of a, 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 some connection to physics, uh, not biology, and he's a historian. So that, that's his um, background. Of course, he's batting for creationism or uh, intelligent design. Um and so he, he does start actually straight on with methodological mat- naturalism being this hurdle. Um, and he asked whether rejecting it, um, if you do it subject to a strict and objective methodology, which we'll come back to, can be legitimate. So that's the question. That's how he starts us off. And then he gives three models um, that are proposed in philosophy of science to account for um scientific explanation so the idea is do we have a naturalistic evolutionary we would have thought explanation of the apparent design in nature or uh, could the scientific explanation be design so francis over to you please give us <laughs> a detailed account of all three Drummer. oh right okay um <laughs> did anyone read my comments on the no that i said i did read my co- your comments and that's why i set you up yes and so you great big elephant trap that you set for me yeah yes uh, so we've decided not to do that and actually it isn't part of the thread of his argument um i could note in passing that i, I did look them up in the stanford encyclopedia of philosophy and it, it does have an article on scientific explanation uh, and it gives these three that he mentions. And so they're probably the most important three. And there are two more in that article that they give five. But um, it... and just to clarify for listeners, what I said was, let's not go there. This is like way too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could say that um, each each problem, uh, sorry, each of the models has a problem. Because, uh, of course, you know, this is philosophy and that's what philosophers do. They work out the strengths and weaknesses of each of the alternative ways of accounting for reality. Um, so the kind of thing you have, there, there's a very kind of clunky, old fashioned sort of account of science and scientific explanation. And that falls down almost at the first hurdle when you have a disease which, um, or a symptom of a disease, which may occur if you have the disease or may not. And apparently under this particular one, if you have um, this, this symptom, you can't say it's scientifically explained by the disease because the disease might not produce that symptom. So it's, it's that clunky that it's, it even doesn't manage that case. So things mm. get a little bit more. Sorry, yeah, carry on. I was just going to say uh, philosophers love to do that. They love to take an example of something that's um, an explanation for something and which superficially seems quite good. And they say, ah, oh, but what about in this situation? And they'll come up with a situation which um, fits all the criteria and yet which everyone knows is it doesn't work in, in, those, yeah. in those circumstances. And it's, uh, so you have to go back to the old drawing board and try and re- rejig your, your model and your, uh, your criteria to try and work out something that's better, that's a more exact fit. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. That's yeah, what so what um, like doing. Now there's you can imagine what the um ultimate part of science where explanation really comes a cropper. Um I won't say it yet. Let's we'll give you a little Liz Trust silence and um mm-hmm. you can think what it's mm-hmm. gonna be and then we'll tell you. So Francis, what what is it? Blimey, I knew you were gonna come to me and I don't know what you're talking about. It's called the physics. Yeah. Oh, of course, it's well, yeah, well, of course, I wouldn't know what you know. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should have asked Andrew, but but uh, you should have asked well, Andrew. I'm not a scientist. Yeah, so should have asked Andrew. A biblicist. <laughs> yeah, but, but somehow we kind of know that con- whatever yeah. something you want something weird in science, you go for quantum physics, don't you? And if, if yes, you want, of course. Yeah. And if you want to explain something unex- that, that's clearly woo, you use quantum physics because it's got that weird thing that says, "Oh, well, this is just like quantum physics." Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. 
multi-dimensions so, uh, and multiverses and everything as yeah. well it all comes in these days <laughs> <laughs> so but anyway, universe yeah in a way this chap is he's he's almost just showing his knowledge to sort of bamboozle you maybe because of this doesn't really lead very far um what he does do is notes that um methodological math naturalism actually isn't an inherent outcome of any of his explanations that he discusses any of these three um it's not inherently required by any of them um but um he does say that all of them uh would allow for um features uh, the kind of features of scientific explanation that that they allow for id can be made to fit intelligent science can be made to fit and be a legitimate science or a a legitimate scientific explanation under them um and then he he also talks about uh kinds of science where design is quite is, is uncontroversial so forensic science he mentions uh and he talks about seti which is this um search for extraterrestrial intelligence and um so there would be certain criteria i think that's the better example because there'll be certain criteria that have to be quite rigorous to filter a signal mm. from space to indicate that it's likely to have a design aspect rather than just random noise do you, do you want to talk about Dembski, which he deals with and his criteria for inferring intelligence or i would design? love you to yes please Oh, no, I asked if you wanted to, but I will. I am, I am actually <laughs> okay. ready to. I'm right, getting okay, a dry so, throat already. <laughs> uh, Dembski, um, uh, who is the scientist who Ed has already referred to, who is one of the co-editors of the book and um, a big supporter of intelligent design. Um, and uh, his, he has some criteria for inferring intelligence or design, and the criteria are complexity. So where you've got um, complexity, the more complexity you've got, the less likely it is that something will have arisen by chance. And added to that, specification, where there is specified small probability, and the two put together to talk about where you've got specified complexity. And so an example of this is, say you had a safe, where there are a quadrillion possible combinations for opening the safe com- combinations of the numbers. And on your first try, it opens. Well, um, of course, any one combination, including the c- correct combination, is no more likely or unlikely than any other combination. And we, we do tend to think that if we see, um, oh, if, if somebody gets, um, like, is it a royal flush in poker where you get all the cards of one suit? You think, wow, that is an incredibly unlikely hand. And it is an incredibly unlikely hand, but it is no more unlikely than every other single combination of 13 cards you could get. But it's just that it happens to be a particular pattern that you want. And so although the chances are, I can't remember, you know, 146 million against or whatever it is getting that particular combination, the, it's also 146 million against getting any particular hand. So, I, I mean, to me, this sort of actually um, leads to a problem that for me with, with Dembski's um, uh specified complexity and criteria for uh, intel- for inferring design which is that in that you've already identified beforehand what the desirable outcome is and i don't see that as a good match with uh, the outcome of biology where who knows if that's a desirable outcome or not i mean who knows whether we are the most desirable outcome of biological processes. There may be, it, it could have been, that there could have been a far more desirable outcome. Of far, and who's doing the desiring in this? Anyway, when you're playing a hand of poker or when you're trying to open a safe, obviously you are doing the desiring and you get what you desire. 
But here it's more, it's a bit like puddle thinking that, you know, we're thinking, hmm, well, this produced us. Well, that's a rather magnificent result, isn't it? Obviously, anyone starting at the beginning would have hoped that the outcome of all this would be exactly like us. You know, we wonderful humans uh, who are allowed to live in this wonderful universe. But yeah, that is us kind of projecting our um, preferences and our priorities onto um, what exists. And of course, we have those preferences and priorities because we're the outcome. I think I want to be a bit slightly more fair. Uh, Do not, you? Not you charitable. Been, are you saying I've been unfair? No, Ed? I didn't. Uh, charitable. <laughs> I want to say more charitable. Charitable, charitable yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I always like the analogy of a camera and an eye because they just do look so similar with lenses and all the rest of it. And um, so to me, it's the function which is the specification in, in biology. So that the, it's complex. A camera's complex or an eye is complex. There's lots of different parts to it. Um, it's not just a ma random mush of, of bits of tissue. And it seems to be have a specification to it in that it's perfectly set up to fulfill the function of uh, transferring light into a signal um, in, in up a nerve. So uh, th that gives the two. And so the complexity and specification is a good way of identifying apparent design, but doesn't necessarily mean it's design. But isn't, uh, isn't it true to say that the eye has evolved separately in as it's three at least three different species? Oh, yeah, more than that. Yes, yeah, five or more. Yeah, exactly. Which sort of suggests that, that it's, it's not design-driving specificity, but outcomes sort of helping towards the... Um, you know, the, the benefit of outcomes, which are producing um, a greater uh, alignment with what works for the, for the organism. Yeah, but I think you're talking about how we got there or, or how the eye got there, rather yeah. than that, that the actual arrangements have, are fulfilling a function. It's not, it, 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 it's not just a random arrangement. No, uh, no. It, the, the random factors of have settled on that arrangement because it's so good at accurately um, converting light signals into nerve signals. Mm. Um, so that, that is a thing. It's a thing we see in biology. To use the um, example of the safe, every, I mean, quadril a quadrillion is a big number, obviously, I can't deny yeah, that. It, it isn't massive. But if, big, every yeah. time, if every time you got the num one of the numbers right, it kind of saved it. So that you then had just had to go back on and work on the other numbers, yeah. then that's more like what is happening with um, things like the eye, and it's less of this kind of um, striking example of getting a specified outcome. I mean, you do in the end, you get there in the end, but isn't isn't that what is so significant? about biology that you get there in the end rather than you get there immediately or first yeah, go yeah, yeah. at the quadrillion gamble yeah well i i like to try and generalize it and um i've probably said this before so i'll try and be quick that the combination of lots of random events and selection is the way to get apparent design so uh when you look at the sky and you see there's a, um, a picture of a face in the clouds. Um, people are looking at the sky all, you know, loads of times, millions of people look at the sky occasionally. So there's, there's sort of millions of people will be looking at the sky and there'll be millions of cloud formations coming and going. And so it's not surprising that occasionally uh, you'll think, oh, you select fit. And you say, oh, look, that looks like a face. And you tell your friend mm. and they say, so you've done a bit of selection and you've done a bit of, um, and there's lots of random events. Or, or maybe another one would be a, a pebbles on a beach um, and all the beaches in the world. Someone sooner or later will find a, a, a pebble that looks just like a face. 
and might put it in a museum or something. And you think, wow, right. that's amazing. And it'll be indistinguishable from maybe your, your child's art project in the pottery, um, pottery room. Mm. Uh, but one will be designed, the, the child's pottery, and the other one will be just a random... Uh, yeah, just random an event interesting and selection. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then evolution is in the, using the method similar to what you described for selecting the number and then locking it and then finding the next number and locking it is the way it's sort of vaguely similar to how biology does this selection of lots of random events. Mm. So um, just to clarify on that, that um, using the language, just wanted to pick up on the fact that you can't help but use the language of design in something without yeah. a designer because well, it's, you, yeah, it's I mean, the, hit, it's, it's, yeah. the hits and the misses, as it were, when, when everything drops off that doesn't work, it can remain with something that works and then that continues. And then we say it's kind of designed something that's working, but it's got there through a lot of mess ups. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the way I understand it. So it's like, yes. um, you know, all the. Um, it's just so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, we're used to design, I suppose. I, I don't know how much this is like the human brain, but we yeah. it's much easier to use language design style language to yeah. talk about how the eye works than to try and yeah. talk about it without the creationists the, of course jump on that and yeah um, and yeah. Um, rather than Eve Dawkins using the word design because in fact it's it's not it's not a random thing in one sense is it it's like random things happen but things get lopped off and then things get left and things survive and then that then works and then that's workable yeah. and it's therefore then we can say well we were designed to and somebody the other day because I had a bad back issue for ages they said well the reason the human species is a very weak um lumbar is because it's not designed we're not really designed to walk upright <laughs> so <laughs> i thought that's interesting and i thought i suddenly took the word design in there and i thought well there we go it's evolution probably gone away uh, uh, bipedalism is good but it has its issues i can tell you that <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. um, you know yeah, yeah. well it's yeah. i mean it's a metaphor that one can't help falling into i mean i yeah. would certainly talk about you know it was you know Butterfly's wing was designed, yes. uh, but you know, it, aha, it's, it's Yahweh just a, exists. Aha, <laughs> yeah, aha. yeah. yeah you see, it got yeah. you. I, I got am you. so busted. I got you. Yeah, yeah. 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 But then yeah. you get Christians that say, "You see, well, different Christian denominations have evolved over the years." Aha. Oh yes, that's <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> oh no, no, I didn't mean that. Not subspecies of churches. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Adaption and survival, yeah. which is true, by the way. Yeah. I think one of the things I'm pushing back on on this chapter. So he, he, going back again, he's saying scientific explanation has all these philosophical ideas be, behind it when people try. Um, that none of them are particularly kind of nail it, but uh, all the ones that are worth looking at are compatible with design being a um, part of a, 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 a valid scientific explanation. Um, so that the only thing that's stopping us allowing design as a valid bit of science is this methodological naturalism hurdle so that's that's what he's saying when we allow for science uh, to have design in it it's like like you said we're very clear who it is we're thinking about as the designer so it's the it's the the criminal who's left traces around the house that's not just random accidents um or it's the alien giving us a signal that they want us to pick up to see what to, to understand that there's some um, other intelligent agents in the universe. But with this, there isn't, we just don't know. It's just this vague, well, there's somebody out there, something out there with no idea, like you say, with no, nothing to put on it. So you are basically having to just ditch methodological naturalism um, uh, in your science to, to allow that. But if you do, uh, then you get some weird situations. And I like to think of the flagellum one, which is the ID people's favourite. Uh, and this is like a little bacteria that has a propeller looking kind of mechanism um, that um, looks a bit like an outboard motor with, with um, the rotation and the motor and all, all little bit of components in there on a tiny bacterium. Um, so they, they say this is irreducibly um, complex and 
or something irreducible. I forget the word. Anyway, it's a key example for them of something that couldn't have evolved. And so, okay, I say, uh, if we're allowing methodological naturalism, maybe there's a flagellum fairy. And what this flagellum fairy does is, is it tweaks any scientific experiment when they're looking at flagellum. They adjust the electromicroscope images um, and any other way that you want to study this. Um, and this, uh, what the flagellum fairy's aim is, is to distort the evidence to make it look like the flagellum um, couldn't have evolved when actually it has. But the flagellum fairy is just a bit naughty and it wants us to conclude that it uh, couldn't have evolved when it did. So that, that is another um, explanation when you ditch methodological naturalism uh, to explain what they think is this amazing evidence that the flagellum hasn't evolved. So mm. you're doing terrible science by allowing for an explanation that breaks methodological naturalism. You almost, you seem to have to, to assume methodological naturalism, that there's no agent that's tweaking the electric microscope images uh, to get to the, what they're trying to get us to, to reject methodological naturalism. So it, it just seems to be, up its backside. Yes, I mean, they only want us to reject certain types of methodological naturalism. They don't want to hope, open a Pandora's box to pixies and um, uh, poltergeists and ghosts and fairies. They, they yeah. want um, uh, a limited uh, rejection of methodological naturalism. Is, is that fair? Yes. And he says that. He says it's subject to strict and objective methodology you can reject the methodological naturalism but you know you're just pulling that out of a hat aren't you how, mm. how you, you've got to have some some something that's much more um scientific uh, sorry philosophically robust to say okay this this makes this allows us to reject methodological naturalism and that doesn't but they, he doesn't go there at all mm. yes i mean i think you need to be um more rigorous in the, than perhaps he is allowing for. And I don't see how he's going to shut that gate against uh, something like, uh, a, uh, as you say, a phyl phylogium, you know, fairy. Yeah. I don't think I've got the pronunciation quite right. Uh, yeah, I'm um, wrong. Yeah. No, 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 no anyway. I'm guessing flagellum. Wrong. Yes, that's it. A flagellum fairy who simply wants to interfere with the uh, experiments for the sake of it. Yeah. And so is sort of, um, as it were, skating above the surface of the evolved world, but just dropping in every so often, just, just to throw our, our experiments out of whack, just, yeah. just for the hell of it, just for the yeah. hell of it. Well, I think, I think we've, we're happy with, with that chapter and we'll move on to the next one next time we need to dip into this wonderful reservoir of wisdom <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i mean it's only just a springboard for other people to go and think about isn't it on anything that we do here so <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and then to me it's it, it's picked up this key issue uh and that is belief in a, in a god who intervenes in the world so you can actually see his footprints and uh or fingerprints i should say in in the world so in this case it's in um the design of biology but there's all sorts of ways well i mean obviously we'll come on to it when we ask andrew in more detail but the bible's full of god intervening all over the place mm. so it you know it, it it's quite interesting to look at the world and ask well is there an intervening god yeah um, and and that's what i'm hoping we'll do for the next half hour or so yeah yeah absolutely um um, so what point does this come into then in terms of right talking about whether we think God intervenes in Christian theology and people talking about it um, or in the Bible itself? Um, well, for a start, let's stay in science. Yeah. Um, can you can you tell I think I thought it last time. Could you tell the David Instone Brewer 
story that he told us when we went to that uh, Rethinking Hell conference? Well, yeah. Well, the thing is, I have a, um, my memory of it because I was there with you and I remember yeah, it. Yeah. I think it was I, so funny, wasn't it? It, it was so yeah, he, funny. Yeah, I like, I like him forever because of this story. We're in a conference talking about d- a different views on hell. And it's like, and then suddenly, I think it was a question that you asked. Funny enough, it's actually on a YouTube clip. Do you remember I sent it to you? I don't uh, think I asked the question. I think. Uh, uh, oh, right. OK. Oh, well, you're definitely on there asking a question. So maybe yeah, I'm yeah, mixing yeah. my memory. Um, yeah, of course. Someone else asked the question, didn't mm-hmm. they? I forget what yeah, question I, you I asked. It was, it was a, a woman uh, asked, and I thought, what a good question. Yeah, OK. And it was, um, yeah, so he was just talking about in the science lab. I think it was a question relating to God doing miracles, wasn't it? I mean, I probably got my memory oh, of it okay. is slightly different. So I think you'll have to tell it because yeah, so I, 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 I just I, found it quite funny that basically he uh, said the punchline. And if I just do that, it'll it, you need to build up that you yeah, only okay. you can do. Yeah. yeah. OK, so. This, this yeah. woman asked the question. Uh, he was interpreting the Bible um, and uh, using other ancient um, texts, um, like the Book of Ezra or something, and the Maccabees and things. Yeah. And um, he was asked by this lady, well, can't you just pray and ask God to show you the... Um, what, what this means and, and use the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to give us the answer. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. Um, I, it needs to be objectively the case. So I need to do all my looking at, up at the um, other texts so that anyone who would look at this will get to the same answer. Just objectively, it's the case. Mm. And, he, and then he said, well, I used to be a scientist. And I'll tell you what I used to do with my science. Uh, to explain what I mean by all this. And because <clears throat> we're after object, getting to objective truth. So she said, I used to set up the experiment and check that uh, all of the instruments were working accurately and weren't going to give any random signals. And um, then check it all over again. And, then, and just before I switched it on, uh, I used to pray. And what did he pray, Andrew? Well, I pray that God doesn't do anything. I think that was basically my memory from it. Yeah, dear God, Because the please. last thing he wants, dear God, don't intervene. I exactly, yeah, don't yeah. intervene. Yeah. Please, don't just... please don't, because you're going to spoil the whole ethnological way of basically science. Um, well, in his particular current setup was science on the text, wasn't it? Um, yes, that's right. But going back to the science experiment, yes. when you were trying to do testable, repeatable things, is what Locke Christian likes to argue. This is what science is, testable and repeatable. Uh, th- then, of course, if, if God throws in something, you've, you've messed up. Yes the yeah. very case right there and then yeah and so, so that, God, you loved it i can remember more you really liking that than actually yes. the details of the story <laughs> yeah I, I just loved it yeah i think yeah it was yeah good. so the same way you know god don't give me inspiration to see that is actually your love behind this text or something no no i don't want that i want to either yeah. discover that for yeah. myself or yeah. it not to be there yeah yeah um, and and it's, uh, that's that. And of course, this this that that uh, humorous anecdotal story actually taps right into the nub of a lot of the questions surrounding this, because it's like um, my feeling is within science. I mean, certainly within if you go to evolutionary creationists or sort of you know, theistic evolutionists as it used to be, it's a term that's sort of moving more over to evolutionary creationists now. So in other words, you can hold the same, like Alistair McGrath, you can hold the same absolutely identical view of biological evolution as Richard Dawkins, but God is actually involved doing the whole thing. Um, and that's why it's all there. But the, still, the whole thing is working. And it goes back to Francis's point. How come the whole process can work for Richard Dawkins in the same way as Alistair McGrath? But Alistair McGrath says God is behind it and in it and upholding it all. And it's a, it, that's that's... Alistair McGrath's form of divine intervention, that the whole, what we call naturalism is in fact God in, in a crazy way. So that's one way I've been presented with how, say, a, a theistic evolutionists uh, think about it. So what would you have to say to that in terms of God in science? Are you, are you, asking are you asking? asking? Both of you. Yes, I'm asking. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll let no, not me, rhetorical. But... <laughs> um... Well, I don't, I don't know that, that there's uh, a lot uh, that I, I can add to what I've already said. I mean, it is like that situation that I, I suppose they, um, that Alistair McGrath is coming with some underpinning views about it, but 
he isn't proving the underpinning views. He's just slotting them in underneath. But then and Dawkins is managing to come to the same result without Without um, those underpinning, underpinning views. So yeah. you do wonder, yeah. so, I mean, what are they actually doing? You know, what, yeah. what purpose are they serving? It's like a handle that can be turned without moving any other part of the machine. Yeah. And, it, and you might it, as well dispense with it. You know, exactly, it's not really like part the, of the machine. It, the analogy, it yeah, that, that you mentioned, Ed, you know, about, about all of these sudden things. Well, what about, well, the dragon in the room one is the famous one, isn't it? You know, um, basically at the end of the day, you get to the end of the, end of the scenario and you realise that, it wasn't there in the first place. You know? Yes. Is so, this um, S- S- Sagan, Carl Sagan? Carl Sagan, yes. Uh, and the, and the dragon in the, in the garage around the, the back. The dragon in the garage around the mm. back. That's right. Oh, yes, yeah, that's, that's right. It. And then yeah. it goes, um, so there is a dragon in the back. And it goes, well, you're looking for evidence from it. And it says, well, it's a dragon that actually doesn't um, stand on the floor, is it? Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, not, but, it's similar to the gardener. That, yeah, it's um, similar to the gardener. That's right. And then yeah, it goes, well, what about the breathing and on the wind? I mean, I've probably forgotten it totally, but basically there's always an answer to why you're not finding it. And in the <laughs> yes, end, you right. might as well not have been dragging there in the first place. Or in fact, one I heard a long time ago, it's the great one, isn't it? It's like, um, yeah, similar to a, it was even using a dragon. There are no dragon in this just to prove how prayer works. It goes, I know prayer works for sure. How do I know? Because can, uh, they used, uh, um, there's no dragons in this room. And they go, there's no dragons in this room. See what I mean? I prayed that there would be none, and there's none. Um, so, <laughs> so it's yes. like... Um, it, I, it, I always tell that joke when I was at eight. Yes. About elephants with... with paint yeah, well, elephants it's very on the bus. Is it elephants? Some, somebody throwing stuff out of the bus to keep but, the elephants away. Yeah. I heard that uh, elephants um, paint their toenails yellow so they can hide <laughs> upside down in the custard in the Oh, fridge. okay. <laughs> I, I thought you were talking about the one about somebody sitting on a bus and they keep, I don't know, they keep throwing something out and I, the person sitting out and says, what are you doing? And it says, it's to keep the elephants away from the back of, from, from chasing the bus. And the, the person sitting out and says, but there are no elephants. Says, See? See, See how exactly. well it works? Yes. And by the way, all of these stories are proving evolution right there. We've got little offsprings, <laughs> little offshoots of different versions of these stories yes. that are adapting <laughs> and creating. Mine was a dragon in a room, which is similar to the one in the garage. And yours yeah. is um, an elephant with buses and, and, and the fridge, yeah. And, yeah. So and upside um, down and custard. Upside yes. down and custard. So all of these <laughs> yeah. stories have evolved and changed, probably coming from maybe different sources, maybe the same. But um, it just shows the point, doesn't it, that people can get. I, I do remember this book that I've got that actually was really, 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 really interesting from from a Christian point of view. Uh, not at the time, but I realised this was about a book that wrote a chapter on this guy that went with some people that seriously believed in UFOs and aliens, like deeply deeply, deeply believed in UFOs and aliens. And he was walking with them. He's a journalist and he was writing down a chapter for this book. He's walking mm-hmm. with these people. And then one of the guys is saying, um, fervent believer in aliens. He's saying, well, I think that they're really coming in the spaceships and they're, they're um, going around the earth like this. And they sort of came in this time, in this period, and they sort of act like this. And the other guy says, oh, no, 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 they don't. Now, I do believe in aliens, but they don't, they haven't really, they didn't come at that time and they don't really operate like that. And he, this guy, this journalist was mm. a shock to see this incredible debate that was so serious between them when he thought they were both personally, probably in his mind, nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> um it's you know so it's like flat earthers you say no there's an ice wall around and others go don't be silly it's an infinite plane and the normal person looks at them and say uh have you been drinking or you too much pizza or what <laughs> i mean it's, but they're serious that's the, so it's a bit like this in these discussions sometimes it looks all sophisticated and brilliant but it get in one sense it could, it's almost a bit like that kind of conversation mm. um but anyway yeah so to, to putting the looking down the microscope from the other end or yeah. whatever it's that they say, yeah. um, we have adopted methodological naturalism in doing yeah. science for the last four hundred years or something, mm-hmm. and look what it's achieved for us. That um, it, it and isn't that evidence the way that we can well we should say when we were young get man to the moon, um, and all the other amazing things that we've achieved in using science since, isn't that a verification that methodological naturalism is more than just methodological, but naturalism. Right. Yeah. Um, is it evidence for naturalism? Is it, is it evidence for naturalism in itself? Well, maybe Francis is good. She's yeah, good yeah. at her philosophy and her deductive arguments. I don't think you can make a deductive argument by saying that uh, the success of assuming naturalism 
uh, and all the brilliant results it gives um, no, proves not. naturalism, but it is evidence for naturalism. Because uh, it's the best, know, the, the best explanation for what you get is that naturalism is true. Otherwise, you have an intervening God who intervenes in such a way as to produce results. I don't know. Um, I think it's more, you know, I mean, I think you can't, in the same way that you can't um, prove the rules of logic by logic, you use the rules of logic to mm. prove other things. Mm. I think in the same way you use methodological naturalism to prove other things. And, and another, it's also like, um, uh, what's his name? Occam's razor. Occam's yeah. razor isn't, a rule of logic or it's not something you can prove it's what they call a heuristic device which is just that it's um a good way of um cutting to the chase really and and sort of making things work work sensibly and i i think it's just the it's not so much that there's an argument as such to prove naturalism it's just that it's not it, it doesn't prove it but it does work so it's like the scientific method works but you can't prove the scientific method by using the scientific method you just use the scientific method and you see that it works to prove other things and to um, way you put it yeah uh yeah and and, and to sort of achieve the results that, yeah. that we need from it I, i'm not sure I, I wouldn't i don't think it's a particularly good analogy it sounds like it's the same thing, scientific method and nat methodological naturalism. But to me, the scientific method is various methods that overcome the bias of humans and uh, the randomness of experiments with repeatability. And it's all those sorts of things. They're just ways of removing error from doing science. Well, I think method. Um, the methodological naturalism is, is, you know, to my mind, it's an aspect of Occam's razor that if you start introducing the possibility of things from outside the natural world, where does it end? You know, it's very difficult to see where you could draw the line. And there's so well, it, it's well, I could say, I could say, OK, I'm going to methodologically, I'm going to assume that the sun has no impact on the earth in any way. And I'm going mm. to do science making that assumption. And very quickly, I find that all my science just falls apart because of um, they just can't hold. Mm. And the sun does have massive impact on what happens on Earth. So um, the the assumption has been disproved um, because it doesn't work. But yeah, when but you what, take what... methodological naturalism, it works fantastically and has done continuously for all these years. Yes, and but the it's, most simple. I'm, sorry, carry on. Sorry, I mean, I, I suppose I, I just don't see those two things as comparable because um, methodological naturalism is just a, a methodology, whereas I don't know. I mean, oh, okay. I, I don't. Well, see, I mean, that, that's, I didn't. I don't see it as a methodology. Oh, really? Well. Okay. Well, there we are. There you have it, listeners. Yes, I say it's just so disagree. Let's assume, <laughs> let's assume naturalism because it's difficult yeah. to do science without. Um, yeah. And um, and then, well, blow me down, it works. And if we assumed uh, naturalism when it, when it isn't the case, then science wouldn't work. You'd have an intervening God doing exactly what David Inson Brewer uh, hoping he doesn't mm. do. And you get all these uh, strange results that, that don't um, but provide consistency. There is a mix on this, of course, like a deist might say that God simply upholds and so the whole thing can actually work like a sort of a i don't know um it all plays out on a stage but the stage is the deist foundation and mm. um doesn't there is the intervention is precisely because he holds everything in being if you like and then there's this this process which is just a law that carries through that's how that's what i was meaning by alison mcgrath almost sounds like but it's yeah. if you go that route you then have a problem with a god that does anything because he's doing everything um yes. and so um, he's also a bit boring because he's entirely predictable yeah oh yeah so a miracle would be the very in other words naturalism is the miracle of god um as opposed to We've got something natural and then God does something supernatural. It means it means everything like the, the, the very 
fiber of the universe itself is God's action in some way. Um, it's a lot laws of logic. That's what they argue, isn't it? Laws of logic, physics, everything. It's all God. Um, that's why everything works consistently and with laws because that God in a sense maintains and set up the laws. That's, that's the actual argument, isn't it? Mm. Um, but that, mm. like I say, as we'll get onto the Bible, it kind of like really falls apart that particular view, I think, mm. um, at least in ways, but yeah. So what would we say to that though, that, that, the, that the naturalism itself has been, um, they would say, they would say probably that atheists are trying to get rid of God who is in fact the source of naturalism. Um, and so, um, Whereas the, the atheist is saying naturalism doesn't need God. Do you see the difference? And yet the same yeah. observable things mm. in front of you are consistency, law-like. Oh, that's because we have a God that's consistent and law-like. You know, I've heard people say this, you know, the reason. Oh, yeah. the reasons of people will sometimes yeah. say that, you know, um, that's why you couldn't do science without theism, because you have to have this confidence that's... that things will always react yeah. in, in the same yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and then you'll we'll see later looking at the Bible, it really f- runs right up against a brick wall um, mm. on this. But that's um, that's that's where they go. And so that's why I see it as almost like, in a sense, theism hijacks when they really know the evidence of science is actually showing the evidence of science. They're going to go, well, what's the best way to do it? We won't have God poking his finger in because that's like how is this process happening without God in the first place? You know, for him to even poke his finger. Yeah. It's like, it's like coming across a dinner that's being sort of half cooked, if you like, and then going and then start to stir it about and add some things. But then if you walk away, it then carries on doing stuff. Um, uh, what, who set that up in the first place to even come up to poke it? <laughs> you know, so, I mean, um, um, I think to me, I think people want both sides, a cake and eat yeah. it version. You know, you, you want, they want the God to be doing everything and then doing some things on top of everything <laughs> so so um <laughs> yeah. yes and do um, everything in an incredibly boring predictable way yeah yeah it's just a predictable way that makes you think that hey perhaps this is um a bit of a lack of personality going on here because it's just so yes. law-like <laughs> yeah. and it's also uh, as dawkins said um indifferent yeah um, M- mercilessly pitilessly yeah yeah that's pitilously. right i'll, I'll yeah, give the quote because it's so famous yeah um The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Indifference. Yeah. So it's either a boring God or an indifferent God or a non-existent God or a God who somehow doesn't have the ability to intervene once you set it up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Or, uh, well, yes, but um, or, or a sort of a, another that we were trying to explain when I was because I sat in a lecture with Alistair McGrath and um, we're talking about this and raising questions about because I was raising questions about evolution and its sort of awfulness in one sense from a Christian point of view of death to make life and the whole cycle of it not, you know, being like you need death for evolution to work. <clears throat> and we've talked about this, mm. but when it was talking about try, God intervening sort of like to do things. He was saying it's not so much that God winds up the clock and sets it off he, that he I couldn't I found it quite interesting that he said it, but he said something like God is intimately involved within evolution. And um, like it's not just I'll 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 set this off and, and just, you know, like you wind it up and let it go. It's not like that. It's more like you're constantly running the cogs of everything. And yet and this is the evolution we see. I, I found that really hard to even embrace as a concept because it's like from a human point of view the way we feel it's so cruel and god is cruelly causing the tsunamis and the earthquakes and the death and the killings and the all the 98 percent of all living creatures have gone you know um yeah and what's left and this is god all the way through you know it, um it's incredible um mm. no wonder the young earth people say it's silly or, or just wrong basically yeah. but that's what he was saying so i thought he was saying it because he's alice mcgrath was getting out of god's intervention for the most part as we tend to see it because he didn't want god to be distant from evolution that's the way i understood it in the lecture anyway he didn't yeah. want the idea that evolution is a clock running off from a distant god you know that yeah. god is in every corpuscle in some mysterious way as it yeah. as it you know in the universe so can, can we move on from yeah. the biology now Yeah, and, and just say, well, let's have the hypothesis that there is a God uh, that, uh, or there's an agent in the, in the world uh, that's intervening so that naturalism is broken 
and yeah. just as we observe the world, we we will see some intervention. And I would say that if, if you're going to pro propose that and look for evidence of that, you can't just go for uh, bits of science or everyday life even, which appear to have to be inexplicable. Just weird. What on earth's going on there? Oh, it must be God or it must be some supernatural agent, a ghost or whatever. Um, it, there has to be a purpose that is discernible. Otherwise, it's sort of, it, 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 you could just retrospectively uh, add explanations that uh, almost conflict with each other uh, as you go along. Um, so you've got some unexplained event. Oh, well, maybe the God wanted this to happen. Yeah. Uh, and then another unexplained event. Oh, maybe God wants something else to happen, which seemed to be inconsistent with the first intervening um, event. So we're looking for both um, unexplained events, unexplained by science, and a consistent purpose behind them. And that would be, uh, if we saw both of those, then we could say, okay, that is good evidence for some ex for some external intervening going on from the supernatural world. Right. I'm just trying to sum that up in my mind, <laughs> trying to think about mm. that. Um, but yeah, okay. So, well, how would you sum that up then? What you just said, just to make it simple. I'll give an example. Yeah. So, if someone spontaneously recovers from cancer. Yeah. And all the docs are, are completely baffled. Yeah. Uh, and um, maybe it's a, a, a young mum with, with a child that would be completely distraught if she died. Um, and let's say the person was an atheist, the young, young mum was an atheist and um, went to a church and was prayed for, for healing and... Um, suddenly she recovered after that we're then getting a picture that this might be an intervening god right. yeah but if she just uh got suddenly got better and the doctors were baffled uh and there hadn't been any um any um prayer or anything involved or alternatively prayer would be involved right from the start and <clears throat> they'd been to copious healing meetings and none of them had done anything. And then suddenly after the 20th one, something happened. Uh, that seems to be more just a random, random events. Yeah. So you're looking for something more than just an unexplained event. Yeah. I mean, you probably need a lot of double blind scientific tests on that really to get somewhere. Yeah. Because you've just, you know, Oh, yeah. you, you might be thinking about all the people, all the other people that have been praying for healing and haven't. Well, that's um, a big, big deal, yeah, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. But, and then the one does, and then there's also ones without any prayer that do. Yeah. Um, and then there's, yeah, so it's like um, uh, all of that. Yeah. But the Christian response is, is often there's an answer to everything in just different directions. Yes, exactly. You know, so um, when, when you start hearing, thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, you know, if you all died in a car, I remember when we had a very, very serious car crash 30 years ago um, in, in church, the uh, vicar said, um, we just want to thank God for the protection of family here. And I was thinking, well, I think we both thought at the time, I was thinking, well, what if one of the kids got killed? You know, mm. or, one, or one of us got killed and left the kids, you know, you would be saying, well, I know what they'd be saying. They're saying the Lord has decided to take, you know, mm. one of you mm. to the heaven or whatever. That's where, and you just think you can't lose um and so okay well the devil got in you know and they say well why did the devil you know and so suddenly there's all this conversation that non-christians just simply don't have it's just say there isn't that tragic in, in the way that humans yeah. feel and speak but when it comes to an answer i didn't think you know if, if you know it's like so did you not hear that when somebody said about the story about isn't it wonderful about the the people that landed the plane on um uh in new york Oh, in the Hudson River Hudson River and they were saying uh, i think it was not was that because birds went through the engine 
I can't remember. Uh, I think Tom Hanks did it. Tom Hanks, yeah, I think it was the same one. If I'm, <laughs> yes. one yeah, Tom Hanks saves the day. Uh, that's right. With Clint Eastwood directed movies, terrific movie actually. But I think that's the one where the birds come through the um, thing, and therefore the plane is almost certainly going to sort of crash. And apart from his experience, he lands it on the Hudson Bay. Yeah. And um, someone saying it's that amazing protection of the Lord. And it's just incredible. You know, it's well, it's, I think it was on the eighth experience. He said, actually, the, the best thing would have been of God to actually supernaturally steer the birds away from going in the engine mm. in the first place. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, yeah. there's all these different questions on what God could couldn't do. Um, and plus the fact that you miss all the ones where the planes have gone straight down and killed everyone, including many Christians, you know. So, so um, um, uh, yeah, all, all yeah. of these things factor in. Um, but it's getting away from the topic, really. But, you know, it, it does. It is touching into how God does intervene, I suppose. Um, yeah. And you have these poor people who have prayed for for years and years and years mm. <clears throat> and they um, never get better. Mm. And then there's someone next door who, who gets prayed for and they get better in a mm -hmm. supposedly miraculous way. And you think, well, so you could have done it all along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's always counting the hits and ignoring the misses, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, most husbands ignore the misses, but <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Uh, you thank knew you I was going to say awesome. something like that. Yeah, that's right. Just tell him as it is. <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, anyway, okay, now I forgot okay. where we're going. Yeah. Okay. Well, Andrew, I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. So this is how I try to set it up that okay. um, that that we're looking for. A consistent pattern to um, this supposed agent intervening in the world. Yeah. Now you've been in charismatic churches, and you will have come across people who would honestly think that God intervenes all the time on their behalf. Yeah. Right, loads. Right the way down to incredible. You know, I've talked to other Christians about this, and they say, "Really, I was never like that as a Christian." So there is this wide spectrum, and that's another problem, by the way. The different way human beings actually think God is working with them is vastly different vastly different but i've known several people who really do think you know if you're going down a market stall and the lord is helping you choose which scarf to buy no don't buy that one i think you should have this one i've actually talked to people like this i know two people right in my head right now who actually speak like that so it's like uh, you know almost like you know god is literally having more conversation than your partner with you about stuff and it, therefore there is intervention in that's the respect in their language it's like you, you talk to them as if they've just had a genuine conversation two way yeah. with another person, which would have made the day different if they didn't have the conversation. That's intervention. Yeah. Um, particularly if they and, say, and the scarf, which are there on the stall are all chosen by God. Yeah. Or the, it's the classic Trump. parking space, isn't it? Um, you know, I yeah, think, I love that. You know, it's, um, you know, it's suddenly I just need a parking. Oh, thank you, Lord, for saving that. So there's an angel was saying, it's all right. I'm keeping the space for you. You know, um, and, and I remember um, back in the, with the family uh, years ago with the kids um, that this was a really interesting one uh, where, where they thought God, um, it was this conversation, I think, um, that uh, my wife was having with one of the other mothers at the school. This was many, many, many years ago. And they were going to go from primary school to secondary school. And she, the, the other person was saying, we really feel the Lord wants her to go to this school. And we feel that with the Lord's help, she will get a place in that school. And immediately we just thought, well, what about the poor other kids? You know, trying to get to the yeah. school. You know, what is this? Um, it's slightly unfair, particularly if it seems unfair systems anyway. Now it's really unfair. <laughs> or like an exam, isn't it? The Lord really mm. helped me to pass that exam and get the best marks. And it's like, really? That's cheating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say yeah. it would be. And the yeah. Lord, if I was God, I'd say not helping you in the exam, I'm afraid. You're going to have the same level as everyone else. Um, so, yes, the Christians, tons. Of, I know it sounds funny, but tons of Christians I've known speak like this all the time at that level. But I don't know with you, Ed, in your church, they would have as well. At that yeah, well, there were a few. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And then you get right to the other sort who virtually almost like the, the, the Alistair McGrath view of evolution, that really God doesn't do much at all. It's just all in the way of living a good life and it's almost a humanistic form of christianity with a lot of words yeah yeah but they're in the same church we're in the same church and which one's which one's the treasurer and which one's the <laughs> yeah that's right yeah 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 which, yeah, yeah. The which... treasurer is the one who never sees god intervene at all that's right <laughs> definitely <laughs> definitely and I, I was of that ilk yes you never <laughs> see god into, and then the yeah, other ones yeah, sort of see yeah. all sorts of things happen but i'm quite um, making numbers add up yeah 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 that's right you got to yeah no intervention there well look hang around you only gave i mean look at the classic thing in the gospel isn't it you the fact they passed the five loaves and two fishes around in one of the stories and they multiply 
that's exa- that's exactly what you yeah. don't want or that friend at um that conference wouldn't have wanted that um <laughs> because it's like hang around you just gave five and it's fed five thousand people i mean it's it's um this is the intervention in the the other way now <laughs> it's, it's do you know what i mean when we bring yeah. that story mm. um and christians of course believe that sort of thing has happened today you know um mm. uh with 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 scenarios like that in, in certain parts of the yeah. world anyway now what, now what do you think andrew um if we have the hypothesis that there's a god acting in the world yeah and he's the christian god um what purposes would we expect to see uh being being revealed by the pattern of intervention the, 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 that we see in the world because of I kind of threw out love and justice as sort of two things that God might you might expect God to do but I'm not sure Christians would do say that what that we were expecting that the purpose of God's intervention is love and justice um, yeah those are sort of two ideas <clears throat> you know okay we you know we, you're, we're positing a God who's over the world yeah, uh, and he's able and willing to intervene. What yeah. kind of things would we expect? Would we, you know, as a loving God, maybe we expect to see loving things happening, or maybe he's a God who's into justice? These are the two things that normally yeah. get brought expect- up. And yeah. then, so you know, the, you get people getting their come up comeuppance, um, but we don't see either. No, uh, but actually, I'm not sure that's what either, Christians much. think. Or yeah. Not. Well, in my experience in the church, it was one of the problems. I would have thought that if something was really true and working about this, it would the church would somehow at least be quite clearly a beacon of something amazing happening compared with anywhere else. That's the way I would have seen validation of intervention or some kind of thing happening. Hey, how come 99% of Christian marriages um, last and uh, 50% of other people anywhere else outside of Christianity don't. Mm. That's just one example, but they don't. There's just as many splits in and out, you know, um, it's just as many issues in and out. In my experience, I'm saying that I would yeah. say, you know, all the bad things so-called that non-Christians do, they're all the Christians in the church are doing the same things, just with more guilt. And so, <laughs> and so um, um, my observation was that it doesn't seem to actually work. And my, one of my earliest experiences is that some of the nicest people I knew on the planet were not in the church you know and it was like um mm. why is that you know why were they some of the meanest um you know or, uh, damaged and remaining damaged people including maybe i would not necessarily excluding myself even i'm just saying it doesn't seem to work um and i would expect an interventionist kind of god that you look over here and you say yeah i can't understand it but those christians you know and particularly that sort of christian the jehovah's witness <laughs> you know so <laughs> yeah. um, that's where it's happening but no i don't see it it's just a mess of confusion of mixed good and bad which you find everywhere you know yeah so it's yeah. like anyway so that would be my my answer to that. yeah that, that's what <clears throat> opened me up well one of the things that opened me up yeah. to really look at all this and uh, start to use evidence and reason yeah yeah um, yeah and also one of the other things I liked was what Reasonable Doubts guy said, just this one thing. I've never, ever forgotten it. Even if you put the most charismatic Christian to the most rationalistic Christian out there to the test, you're going along and you have an accident and say one of your children has a serious accident and break their arms and everything's all like broken and they get taken to hospital and you've got two rooms to go to. You've got the prayer room for healing and you've got casualty with the operating table. What do you do? <laughs> I don't think I know a Christian that would go in the prayer room at that point. Yeah. As, as that's the only choice. Oh, yeah, my prayers are with you and God's with you and everything else. And let, let him guide the operating table. Fine. That's what they say. But they wouldn't say, no, we don't want to go to uh, the operating table. Yeah. We go into that prayer room because God is a healer. At yeah. that point, I don't think I know anybody would actually do that. <laughs> I think a Christian science people get pretty close. Yeah. And Joe is going to do with the blood, uh, with the blood to compute. Uh, um, not, no blood. Um, what is it called? Oh, yeah, no yeah. blood transfer. No well, blood transfer. That's Jehovah's Witness. Witness. That's right. Heard. So, yeah. No, um, there are people but, like that. So, and, so it um, does happen. But I'm saying I don't know anybody because yeah. um, um, who I think that everyone would crack and just go straight to casualty and just put God in there with it. Back to that view again. Like yeah. God is with the surgeon's knife. Thank goodness, because if it was an ungodly man with no God, that surgeon's <laughs> knife wouldn't work. <laughs> you know? So it's like uh, I've actually had people pray like that. May he guide his hand. You know? It's yeah. Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, this is the kind of point you're making, Ed, isn't it? Does he do that or not? You know. Um, yeah. And I'm thinking. That's right. And he doesn't. And and yeah. but when you ask Christians, sometimes they don't go for the love and justice or, or love or justice or either. They say, oh, well, God manipulates things for the maximum number of people to respond to the gospel. 
which doesn't necessarily seem to be working either. No, I wouldn't have thought there's much <laughs> evidence of that at all. Yeah. And, and, and to add insult to injury to both of you on this, we have talked to people like Chris Day who think every single thing that happens is ordained anyway. Doesn't that rule out intervention of any sort? Because the whole thing is one big, big solid block of unchangeable intervention. Yeah. You know, so if you've ordained... That's that, interesting. Do you mm. see what I mean? If you've ordained the Holocaust and if you've ordained this baby to die, that baby to live, that person to be a Mormon, that person to be a Calvinist Christian like Chris Day, that person to be the Arminian, uh, where, where does God intervene to do anything? Like when I asked Chris Day, did he ordain that the traditional view of hell should be the dominant one for most of the church history? And he said, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> even though he didn't believe in that view, that was God's truth. Mm. And it's like, wow. So I think Calvinism throws a spanner in this anyway, um, because it's like, how do you intervene with something you've ordained? It's crazy. Mm. Mm. Uh, It seems to me crazy. And now we're using logic, um, which is meant to either go back to God or what? I don't know. But (laughs) So um, Uh, next question. (laughs) Okay, next question. Um, How about when we look at the Bible? Can we? Is there a pattern of, uh, or well, a picture of an intervening God in the Bible? Absolutely. Uh, there's also a picture of evolution in the Bible, not that sort of evolution, but evolution <laughs> of this very question. So um, you've got hundreds, and it's no joke, hundreds of passages that talk about God intervening in the world in a way that the, the writers back then or the people writing about God didn't have any problem thinking about God being like it seemed. Yeah. Because he would bring curses and you know boils and uh, diseases on people for bad behavior not following laws or something like that he would bring stop stop the rain start the rain cause famine withdraw the famine um you know choose choose life passages choose life passages yeah yeah and so in the earlier parts of the bible it seems all the older stories god is very much involved almost himself like talking to moses um directly or in some kind of fire or something and then he's acting again you know like the one where we've talked about where god says i better not come with you in case i uh, get angry that 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 was yeah. in f- when he did go with them it was with fire at night and a and a you know i mean if we're talking you know yeah. like, that's why it was miles away from the lecturer with um alistair mcgrath thinking hang around god is just behind this whole process of evolution what about the fire and the smoke that walked in the desert and they followed him that what where does that fit in because it's like um Okay, they're just metaphors or stories, but no, a lot of Christians take it very literally that that's what happened. And the, he opens up an earthquake, swallows people, lots of fire comes down from heaven, burns people up. This yeah. is this is like Middle Earth in Tolkien, far closer to the world I see around me today. And God is not supposed to change. And so, and uh, but they, some people do do that, don't they? Like they, the hurricanes are still God. Um, and matter of fact, wasn't yeah. it one of your friends that thought that God intervened? been with the hurricane in england and uh, it was it england um not her- no, i not her- uh, well my friend uh he it was a conservative counselor in the local he, he was in my church yeah and he, later on after i stopped going he became the conservative counselor in the henley town council yeah um and then uh, at some stage he went to ukip uh and then he made a I think he was still a conservative, made a fool of himself by saying that the floods uh, the early in Cameron's time, so would have been about 2010-ish, um, there were these floods. And he said it was because of the government policy of uh, legalising gay marriage. <laughs> The floods, on the, mm. floods, the floods in the south of England. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And they've just said the same about the big one in... Um... Florida right now and they've had they've oh done, really yeah when well some people have yeah some they yeah. always can say something don't they even the virus was this the, for COVID but it's certainly New Orleans do you remember that was all to do with a similar thing yeah the so Haiti God, one was very the horrible. Haiti one yeah so God basically does is very very um um against sort of homosexuality and stuff and therefore still does but actually it's quite consistent with the way that my point is the old testament does speak a bit like that that god gets angry at behavior and he does smitings cursing boils he also does blessings protection from other armies but there is an evolution and so we won't be too long on this because then we need to actually get to talk um about one of our emails that's come in Yeah, yeah but um just to sort of on this particular point with the bible there is a gradual change over time in the bible because you know should i make make the point that god was um like even in the beginning narrative of one of the parts of the creation story god walking in the garden himself you know mm. um, we've talked about god's body and how it does seem to be believed that god seemed to be seen somehow 
and coming up to Abraham and stuff. But as we move through, we get even God's judgment by fire changes. It was fire coming from heaven. It was um, that kind of thing. We then get to the later parts of stuff that were written and later part of history. And God suddenly is speaking through prophets. He's not walking around in a body talking to people uh, or seemingly so. He's actually talking through the prophets. You know, God says nothing. I think there's a passage that God says nothing, save he says it through the prophets or something. Um, And you think that's interesting. So now God's voice is a voice of a human that's speaking for God. That's interesting. Now there's things like the fire that used to come from God is less seen. It's now an army that that attacks somebody who burns down the city. And that's the fire of God's judgment. So it's now removed to humanity. I find that really interesting. And this gives us the ground to move to that God's getting a bit more distant. And this is probably why Greek philosophy can come in and then God can become the great other. And then he can be the sustainer of all things and not be so much of this um, superhero kind of God doing stuff in these very physical ways like manna yeah. from heaven so that would be my take that it's their intervention in a very clear way but it also evolves within the bible to, to being that god's almost becoming further out into space um yeah and, and humanity is sort of taking over of being his fire and also being his people on earth the church is his people isn't it you know the body yeah. of christ and, and, and it's um, uh, yeah i think it carries on um i love reading the venerable bead um so that would have been seventh century or something like that and he has miracles so he talks about there yeah not not that you know not all the time but they have occasional ones yeah but i think maybe by the time you get round to the Cal- calvin and luther and people do they believe in miracles as a sort of um, part of well, normal life um i had mentioned this before in another podcast i'm not sure about up to that point but i do know that one of the um when bar ehrman did his massive book on church history and its growth it said it grew for two particular reasons and one was what, which was fascinating to hear and i remember telling you this ed and i think you were quite fascinated by it but the two reasons for the massive 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 growth well there was three actually for the massive growth of christianity it was um this is the way as opposed to just one of many uh but aside from that it was actually miracle stories that did masses of masses of conversion people just believe them this these miracles were happening to people uh in terms of their belief and it converted them. And it was also the fear of hell, hell and judgment. So it was, in one sense, God's going to intervene with fire or God is going to um, heal and, and bless you with healings and great, great miracle stories. And I found that fascinating because I didn't know that, that, that the church, early church, I mean, into, into some of these later centuries as well, that that was the time, maybe Augustine's time, something like that. But when we get right up to Calvin, I'm not sure if it starts to completely wane that kind of thing. And it gets much more, um, like the Greek views of stuff yeah. that we've touched into. And Francis talks about um, who's that guy. Who's that? Um, who's one of the big Christian names that's more Greek. And um, I'm not sure how much he talks about miracles. So I'd have to do some research. Aquinas. Yeah. That's it. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, kind yeah. of thing. All of that kind of Christianity seems to be quite different from this early miracle believing kind of, you know, and there's a yeah. lot of demons and gods and battles going on in the early centuries of the church first second third centuries god, god and demons are doing an awful lot of stuff together in battle i mean so mm. all of that stuff was believed and it did it did produce belief so it's all to do with intervention really um you know yeah um, so it's not a complete picture of god like a kind of a decay curve of less and less intervention as time yeah i mean it's it, 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 it kind of goes down to a certain level and then stays there yeah maybe things come up and bubble up and then go down again because i mean it is interesting how the Greek view of God, I think, sort of took over. And we've got this contrast again, like we talked about with Plato. Did, did, did they actually believe in Zeus and all of these and Poseidon? Or did they have this sort of ethereal God is sort of other? And it seems that's the case, that they probably had, they've got these stories and it's a bit like the Old Testament. So it is difficult to actually navigate this evolution to spending, because maybe different Christians did look at it differently. And it's very difficult to even find out what the writers actually thought. But, you know, my feeling is, is much more literal than then a lot of Christians actually are willing to go for the Old Testament um, things um, that they really did, or at least lots of them really did think these things actually happened. Um, but, um, and, and then, yeah. and then really did think that God didn't seem to act like that anyway, uh, anymore, because by the time of the prophets, somebody could have said, well, how come God isn't talking to you like he did to Moses? Well, I don't know. He speaks through me now. So don't ask the question. <laughs> <You know, so. laughs> <laughs> and then I, I would have said certainly kind of church of England or school, school assemblies, Christianity, yeah. Uh, 
uh, early 20th century and and beyond maybe you know god's intervention was the world in the world was through us we are god's body or we are god's we are, hands, hands, Jesus and hands feet. And feet. yeah yeah yeah, yeah which yeah. ultimately can lead to humanism because you can start well, to yeah. say well hang on if we're doing it uh we we'll just drop god and become the sunday assembly you know so yeah. it's like <laughs> yeah you know so um um I, I can see how humanism can come out of christianity in a way because in the end you, you can just almost remove god because it's down it's down now to us um yeah. you know you know with with question, yeah. questions you know and the, but, the final twist is there's a massive rise of pentecostalism and that sort of thing in the last couple of two three decades i don't know a, a massive what, sorry. rise of pentecostalism yeah in Africa, well, South yeah. America, yeah, yeah, China, yeah. even I think, which of course goes very supernatural, very back to that sort of, yeah, more primitive view of looking at things. And and I know Christians who know people over in, in places like that, and 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 it's a, it's a different form of Christianity. It really is back to this kind of very very fundamentalist and supernatural belief of how the world actually is, you know, um, uh, much more than the average Anglican, <laughs> much much more, yeah. you know. Um, but anyway. We yeah. digress. We've sort of talked about God's intervention and yeah, hopefully it's a good yeah. platform for people to think about. Good. Yeah. And uh, Francis has got um, some, some uh, feedback to yeah. tell us about. Uh, yes. I had, had an email from somebody called George who wrote to us to say, uh, I heard your episode with Jared Bias, who along with Pete ends and their podcast, maybe single-handedly saving my faith from collapse right now. I just wanted to say I'm starting your podcast from the beginning and I'm on episode 12 right now. Oh, wow. I thoroughly enjoy the conversations you're having as one who has suddenly found himself to be a dreaded liberal Christian after decades as an evangelical Christian. Hmm. I'm realising that the more apologetics I read, the more tenuous my faith becomes. It's as if their arguments are so poorly constructed that it's shaking my hold on a faith I've held since I was a child. I'm curious if you're seeing a similar pattern from others who are willing to share with you. Are these poor apologetics efforts hurting existing believers' faith more than they're helping nudge open-minded agnostics into faith? I hope my question is clear. Well, I think I think it is, George. And he finishes saying, thanks for sharing yourselves with us like you do. Each of your perspectives has enlightened my view, not only of atheists, but also of Christians. So I thought that would be a good one for you too to respond to, because it sounds like um, George um, has had a journey, which to some extent you shared um, with him, although perhaps it's fair to say you kept going um where he's at the moment at a at a place where he's stopped for the net for now so i thought that you might be able to respond to this idea of do you think bad apologetics argument weak apologetics arguments is actually hurting people's faith i, th I think well firstly that, that is an amazing email for someone to write in mm. um absolutely amazing really for someone to be in that position to be open and, and as honest as that and it is actually a frightening place to be I can remember being there and I think this is probably why Francis you're sort of directing the question this way because mm. Ed and I have sort of been there um and I mean for me I'm not sure maybe I had a more uh what Peter Enns calls aha moments uh like with with sort of shocks along the way but I could never have believed I'd be where I am now back in my from, from the past even when I was studying theology at university I could never have seen me go over and when I was on the unbelievable show even Justin said to me you know now I've not I've known many people who struggled like you and become progressives and liberal but not fall off the end <laughs> so I think, I, you know I think you're, Andrew you're in a perfect position to answer because you've got about 10 friends you were all at YWAM together or something yeah I've and, got... and they've all gone in different directions yeah well uh, actually but... the Sort of. Yeah. I mean, I know I do know I, I, I know a whole bunch of people that have almost every doubt I have, but they remain a progressive, very progressive Christian. Like the wonderful Steve. Uh, Tompkins. Like Steve. Yes, and Steve, yeah. and Steve. Steve has been on here several times. Steve is lead guitar in my band and he remains in um, in a very, very. But we would probably agree on anything except ultimately he sort of is on that side of belief in God and Christianity in some sense. Senses, of course, in which other Christians would say he's not a Christian at all <laughs> for being like mm. that. And that's the thing he has to sort of de deal with, I suppose. Um, but I, you can almost be 
our discussion group is like that. I think that the, the, the Christian people in our discussion group, a lot of them are so close to the edge of where I am because I don't even see myself as a diehard atheist. As remember when we went to Greenbelt, I, I came up yeah. as the agnostic and you were doing the atheist. So I, I, I do understand this whole line uh, and progression and stuff. But I suppose the main thing, the main point though, Francis, of, of the question being asked is um, apologetics, isn't it? Yes, and do um, they, are they actually damaging? So, are they counterproductive in terms yeah. of what the apologist I think hopes they, uh, to achieve? Yeah. I think they work. Yeah, yeah. I think they work on a lot of people. I think using um, Justin Briley's inbox as a as a guide, you you get the feeling that um, there's loads and loads of people who encounter these apologetic arguments and and they're quite happy with them and get convinced by them. Yeah, I mean, as um, obviously, I I don't have a lot of personal accounts to give, but I would just refer to. Tom Stark, um, mm. I, and I don't know if we can give a, a, a link to any of his work, um, he's got a moral compromise of which he wrote against Paul Coppan. And he is a Christian. And, and what motivates him is the sense that um, uh, it's Tom Stark is spelt with an H, T-H-O-M-S-T-A-R-K. Um, right. And um, he... He says that what motivates him is that he feels that people like Paul Coppen, who write to justify or minimise the disturbing passages, particularly in the Old Testament, oh, where, oh. you know, the slaughter of the, um, the Malachites and the Canaanites, that he is actually damaging um, the the Christian faith yeah, yeah. and that he will be driving people away because people are going to say, oh, my God, you know, Sorry, yeah. no pun intended, but oh my goodness, yeah. I can't believe in that. Uh, I'm out of here. Yeah. Yeah. So he yeah. wants very much to um, push back on Paul Coppan's uh, minimization of disturbing passages in the Old Testament and to say, yeah. no, you know, yeah. no, you've got to recognize yeah. these passages for how awful they are. And yeah. he he goes into talking because it came to my mind that book his other his main book that that actually his big thing was the compromise that was a massive PDF but he actually did a book called the Human Faces of God that's right it yes, was one yes. of the key things that cracked my view of the Bible at the time and this was in two thousand and ten oh really but he kind of oh yeah absolutely that. yeah but he, but it wasn't him and reading that book he, he, it's that his book somehow summed up everywhere I'd got to including the second coming and the end of end of the age that Jesus. If, if Jesus actually said it got wrong. Tom Stark was the first very progressive liberal Christian to actually be, I felt so honest with the text. I thought this is amazing. And he, so he'd be more like Steve Tompkins, who we talked about, mm. but everything I had struggled with, he kind of was honest within the Bible, you know, particularly these defenses of the old Testament, particularly inerrancy of the Bible. It was one of the biggest influenced books. It's very easy lay read actually, but it's coming from a scholarly mind and mm. someone, someone, so it's both. It's just, it's, he's so well written, so easy to read for someone that isn't a scholar. Uh, it does it in such a way. That was a very powerful book for me, but um, in part of my journey, but, but, it, and a lot of them were progr- like Peter Enns. He did a book as well. And um, which is quite controversial in the Christian church. But to me, that really helped me because at least he was being, he was holding onto faith in some sense, but it being absolutely honest with the text, um, you know, and, and even Greg Boyd started like that to defend the old Testament. And he gave up. Do you remember, did you hear him talk about it? Yeah. He started to go down the Paul Copan defense of the old Testament yeah. and thought, yeah, it's just not working. These apologetic mm. things are just not working. So he came up with a whole new one, which I don't think works, but at least he was honest. And he kind of, he praised Tom Stark's book, by the way. He said it was probably one of the most um, in, influential books on him that he both hated and loved. <laughs> you know, some, <laughs> something like that, because he said it's just excellent. So I'd say Tom Stark, Human Faces of God, get it. But the fact is, I think that um, a lot of apologetics do put some people off. And some people have a wiring where it doesn't, you know. Mm. Um, and so it's it's somehow the person integrating with it that has the interesting story to unveil. Um, because Rather think... Rouse has had another go. And he's he, he's going to be on Unbelievable next week. He's another go at what? Oh. Another uh, go uh, at... Uh, uh, embracing the awfulness of the, the uh, Old Testament in the way yeah. that uh, Copan doesn't. They're actually talking to each other. 
the, the next show of the. Oh, um, that will be interesting. That will be very be interesting. interesting. And my yeah. New Testament um, lecturer, he, I t- we talked about this in one of our lecture classes about the Old Testament stuff, and and he was more like, um, he wasn't really an Old Testament lecturer or New Testament. He's more the theologian of the college, and he just said when we talked about this sort of thing, he just said that what made him worry was that some Christians had no issue with it. <laughs> with the Old Testament. He said, now that's worrying because I think what he was basically saying is that all Christians with a true heart should struggle with their Bible. If they're going to believe they should really struggle. They should wish pages weren't in there. They should wish that God wasn't like that. Wasn't presented like that. Uh, that's the kind of Christian you want to meet. Not the ones that go, yeah, yeah. He'll send a flood um, and he'll wipe you out if you're in near, you know, homosexuality or something, you know? So, um, that's the worrying kind of Christian, not the ones that struggle with the text. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to throw the Bible on the floor now and again as a horrific yeah. book in places, you know? Um, yeah, I yeah. fell off the edge through it all, but I respect. It's so hard to so be many people who haven't have you know? a view and say, yeah, that a lot of people are absolutely shocked and walk away and don't have to think about it again. Yeah. Other people uh, wrestle and wrestle and become uh, like uh, Tom Stark and some people um think oh well, that's, fine. that's fine i believe you cope and of course of course yeah it yeah and it's, it's those people i get a little more worried about i have, because any all the christians that i know that hang on i do have a lot of respect for that i i have i have a real truck with fundamentalism and um because i was once one you know i mm. i said it would be a great title i was once a teenage fundamentalist it's a great title <laughs> <laughs> um and so um um, I do have a lot of respect for those people that I just think, gosh, why couldn't I hang on? What stopped me? What pushed me over the edge? And why can't I be like Steve? And then Steve's probably thinking, why can't I just go over the edge with Andrew? It'd be so much easier. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so it's like, um, um, but anyway, but that email I think was probably an amazing, it's an amazing one for us to get actually. Um, Cause I do get where, where you're yeah. at basically. I totally get where you're at. I was there. Um, definitely. Yeah. And our feedback Email address is doubtsaloud at gmail.com. I think it's a while since we've said that. Yeah, we've certainly been yep. exercising oh. our doubts very loudly um, <laughs> in, in all 57 podcasts. 57. Whoa. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and what, did, what, what was the amount that our listener was on? 12. 12. He was up yeah, to 12. so it'll be a while wow. before we say hi to you. It's, it's, uh, I'm yeah. only 27. Hi, hi, I know, send him another email to say if you want to skip to 57. Um, <laughs> I would do that. We, skip to 67 yeah. to the very end of the podcast and then go back to 13. I think he yeah. might be on yes. something. I've got a sort of question. He might be on the summer of genocide or something by now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be interesting yeah. to go, but I must go back and listen to some of our early stuff. <laughs> so, uh, see if we've changed our views at all. That'd be interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, that would. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, we're all going to become Pentecostalists by what three years time? <laughs> <laughs> young, young Earth creationists. We'll uh, have to change it to doubts not allowed. Then. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Anyway, so um, the Trinity of disbelief here. We'll have to sign off. And um, but I hope this um, episode has been stimulating in some ways and. A bit hard to grasp in others not hoping i mean it has been for me <laughs> a bit hard to <laughs> grasp so it might be for some listeners so until the next um episode of subject we don't actually know we're doing yet um uh, and i have been andrew your host i've been francis and i've been ed bye, bye.